have spacesuit, will travel. This week on Planetary Radio. Hi everyone, welcome to Public Radio's travel show that takes you to the final frontier. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society. A jam-packed show this week as we hear from a leader of the company that NASA has just picked to design the spacesuit that will eventually take Americans back to the moon. Mark Gittleman of Oceanarian International will tell us about this piece of the Constellation program. We've also got a special extended visit with Emily Lakdawalla in which she'll tell us about an instrument that may have detected early signs of a global dust storm on Mars. And Bruce Batts has learned to tweet about the night sky, random space facts, and this week's space trivia contest with your chance to win a Planetary Radio t-shirt. You can visit planetary.org for lots of news about what's going on up there, perhaps beginning with another detailed update on the Mars Exploration Rovers. Emily has much more than that in the space blog. I'll be right back with Mark Gittleman first. Here's Bill. Hey, hey, Bill Nye, the Planetary Guy here, Vice President of the Planetary Society, this week speaking to you from New York. I'm traveling, continuing the Bill Nye, the Science Guy, Change the World Tour, going to various universities back east. Now, this week was quite a week. You know, it was the 100 hours of astronomy, where we got people around the world to take a few minutes and look through a telescope at the spectacular arrangement of planets. And for me, as always, Saturn just has my heart. It's just a beautiful, beautiful object. I also had the privilege of speaking to an organization called the National Space Foundation. They have their meeting every year about this time in Colorado Springs. Now, these are conservative people. There's a lot of military people there. There's a lot of aerospace contractors who make their spy satellites and other exotic electronics, also for Earth observation to keep track of climate change and world weather. These are mostly people involved in making space instruments that look down toward the Earth. Not exclusively, but mostly. But here's the thing. As conservative as they are, they are the dreamers. They want to be part of the future. They want space exploration to be part of the human experience for everyone. It was quite a striking thing for me. Members of the Planetary Society are generally people that want to explore the planets in the solar system, talk about human life outside of Earth, and humans one day living on Mars and other exotic ideas. These are conservative, button-down military people and aerospace contractors, yet we share this vision to have space to be part of the human way of life for centuries to come. It was an exciting time. And we talked about national security, we talked about weather, we talked about climate change, and we talked about the joy of knowing our place in the universe through space exploration. Well, thanks for listening. I'll be back in California next week. I gotta fly, Bill Nye, the planetary guy. New rockets, new capsules, and new spacesuits. All of these and more are part of NASA's Constellation program. We're going to talk about just one of these challenges with Mark Gittleman. Mark is Vice President and General Manager of Oceanarian Space Systems, a division of Oceanarian International. His group has just won NASA's George M. Lowe Award for Quality and Performance, but he may be even happier about the award of a preliminary contract for the CSSS, the Constellation Space Suit System. I talked to Mark a few days ago at his headquarters near Houston, Texas. Mark, I want to thank you for joining us on Planetary Radio and also congratulate uh, you and Oceanarian International on the, the award, at least the preliminary award, of this uh, contract to build the next uh, spacesuit for American astronauts. Well, thank you. It's, it's uh, very exciting to have the opportunity to do this work with NASA, and uh, it's great to be on your show. Now, are you right there in the facility next to the Johnson Space Center? We are. We're across the street from the back gate at, uh, at the Johnson Space Center in um, Clear Lake, Texas. Well, that's convenient. I'll tell you, the first thing that I noticed when I saw this press release and I went to your website, there was this wonderful graphic that uh, I just looked for again. I hope it's still up there someplace. And it shows stuff that uh, Oceanarian International makes spread all over the ocean floor. I mean, remote-operated vehicles and all kinds of hardware for supporting life in 
this perhaps more familiar and more commercialized but very harsh environment, does that say something about Oceaneering's ability to uh, protect us from a different harsh environment? Well, I think it does. I think it speaks to deeply ingrained concern for safe operations. You know, Oceaneering started as a commercial diving company in the Gulf of Mexico about 45 years ago. And we've grown from that to what we are today, but we never lost sight of where we started, which which is um, developing and operating life support systems for human beings. And so whether it's commercial diving or in space, you know, the first thing is the safety of the person who's using your equipment. So to go from deep diving, and, and we can dive with humans past 2,000 feet, up through space, it's all it's all about making sure that you can get the work done and return that person safely to wherever it is they came from. So in one case, you're, you've got humans being protected from the enormous pressures of uh, the, the deep ocean. In this case, it's quite the opposite. You want to keep that pressure inside and, and keep the vacuum on the outside. Sounds like in spite of that, there are similarities in terms of engineering challenges. There are similarities. We all live on the Earth's surface at 14.7 PSI, one atmosphere, and breathe a, a mixture that we call air, that's oxygen and, and nitrogen. When we dive deep, we use air. As we go deeper, we mix gases and use other mixtures, adjusting the percentages. In space, we do something similar. We adjust percentages and pressures. But the main thing is to keep the human being comfortable and provide the human being, the astronaut or the diver, with the right mix of gases and to take away the, the waste gas that, that human beings generate. And so from a macro perspective, the challenges are really very similar. And, of course, you have to keep the environment out, whether it's vacuum or seawater. Uh, you have to keep the environment away from the person. It was a long time ago, probably decades ago, somebody uh, changed my view of spacesuits and said, look, you know, what you've got is a little human-shaped spaceship. I mean, whether it has its own propulsion system or not, it really has to provide essentially all the functions that the capsule or space station or shuttle the, that they just got out of. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You have to keep them thermally comfortable, right? Not too hot, not too cold. You have to provide, of course, the, the breathing gas, the air, the oxygen. You have to take away the carbon dioxide. So it's, uh, that's a very good analogy. They really are small spaceships, human-shaped spaceships, and, and it's the same with the underwater work. We have hard suits of different kinds, advanced diving systems that are anthropomorphically shaped submarines. What kinds of challenges, what kind of standards did NASA set out uh, for the design of this new generation of spacesuits? Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, the spacesuits that NASA has had since the earliest days have all been uh, very safe, and they've proven that over the years. And one of the things that we'll be working on here is not, not just safe, which, of course, you have to maintain, but also easy to operate and maintain over a very long life cycle. So the spacesuits that we've had all these years have gone into space, been used, and then generally they've come back, although there have been some that have stayed on space station for extended periods of time. These new suits ultimately will go to the moon and stay there. And so the operations and the maintenance of these suits need to be something that the astronauts can literally do in the field, if you think of the moon as the field. Mm. So so one thing is, is that they need to be very robust and they need to be field maintainable. Going to try to enhance the crew comfort, there's a requirement for an extended stay in the suit in a, in a contingency or an emergency. So it's, it's things like that, comfort, mobility. One big difference, humans haven't walked on the moon in a very long time, of course. We uh, need these suits to be able to make it comfortable for the astronauts to walk across the moon, bend down and pick up a rock, get in and out of them, helping each other but not much more than that, and then be able to uh, withstand the lunar dust for extended periods of time also. I'm glad you mentioned the dust. That was one I wanted to ask you about. That lunar dust uh, proved to be a bit of a problem for the Apollo astronauts, uh, you know, almost 40 years ago now. We're coming up on the anniversary. Uh, what kinds of measures are you going to be taking? Uh, did, does the company even know yet uh, to defend these suits and the humans within them from this dust, which can be kind of nasty? It can be nasty. Uh, well, we have been working.